<clears throat> if you have your Bibles and you'd open them with me to Psalm chapter 1, the very first Psalm of David, Psalm chapter 1. It's a very short chapter. It's only six verses long. <clears throat> and the Lord laid something on my heart tonight. I think you'll be blessed. I hope you'll be blessed. And by the way, I'm going to stop. Let me just real fast, let me do this. The Holy Ghost has been talking to me this week. We've got a lady who watches us on video. And she wrote us and said, I watch you every week. I listen to the message that the Lord gives you every week. She said, I believe God speaks through you to me every single week. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me this week and said, you got to tell her something. So y'all bear with me for a second, okay? I'm going to talk to Leah, okay? She's in Arizona. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, Leah, and said to tell you, and I don't know the question, so you that's between you and God. But he told me to tell you the answer is yes. Yes, 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 yes. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you need to tell her yes. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. She's asking me a question, and she's waiting for the answer. And I want you to tell her the answer is yes. So whatever the question is, the Lord told you to get up, pack up, and go somewhere and do something. The answer is yes. Whatever the question is, the answer is yes. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, she's kind of like Samuel. And she's kind of waiting there trying to serve the Lord, you know, in the temple. But at the same time, she's hearing something, but she's not sure whether it's God or not. She's not sure whose voice she's hearing. And the Spirit of the Lord said, tell her, yes, that's my answer. Yes, I want you to do. Amen. Okay, that's all. Now, Psalm chapter 1. <laughs> we'll see if she really watches this or not. <laughs> Psalm chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And I read today, actually, I think I have my new King James, I sure do, by accident. Uh, yeah, can I borrow your King James? I prefer to use the King James, good old-fashioned King James. You want my new King James, brother? That's okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I just like the language of King James. I'm an, I'm an old-timey preacher, and I like good old-fashioned King James. And the Word of the Lord reads, beginning of verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Master, we thank you, God, today for the wonderful presence of God we feel in this place. We thank you, Lord, for this facility that you have made available to us in the heart of the very community that we so desperately want to reach with this wonderful, positive, affirming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we dedicate this place to you. We dedicate this facility, this location, this property to the cause of Christ and the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we just pray, God, that you would make this address, 2515 Inwood Road, suite number 213, a soul winning station. Master, help us, God, to break out the walls of this place. Not merely because we're compromising and watering down our message to fill it up, but because, God, we're holding it up without compromise, without watering it down. Help us to find those souls who are hungry. Help us to find those souls, God, who are desperate for restoration and healing and deliverance and salvation. Help us, Lord, today to be a conduit for those who would seek you with a sincere and earnest heart. 
Oh God, today let this place be the upper room of the 21st century where revival broke out, not just for the city of Dallas, but a revival that would eventually reach out and cover this nation one end to the other. Master, help us this hour, God, to turn our hearts, our minds back to you, toward you. Help us, God, to find a place of submission, a place of yielding to your great Holy Ghost leading. Master, pour out your Holy Ghost in this place in a powerful, wonderful, brand new way. We don't need another Pentecost today, Lord. We need greater than Pentecost. For the times today are harder. Men are more wicked. Times have become more evil. And we need an even greater move of God today than your early church experienced in the upper room in the book of Acts. Allow us, God, to be those people that experience that blessing and that great outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Master, today anoint your word. Anoint your speaker, Lord. I always come into the pulpit with a desire not merely to speak my own words, but even in the car today I was praying and I said, Lord, please, please put your words in my mouth. Help me, God, to speak that which you would desire the people of God here. And this is the passage, Lord, that you placed and dropped right in my spirit and said, this is what I want you to talk about. And Master, today, anoint the ears of the hearer. For without the anointing, the word of God is useless to any who might hear it. But we need you today to help the ground upon which this seed falls to be good ground where it might find a root and it might be able to grow and spring forth and bring forth fruit. Grant it this hour, Master, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. This, this is a very straightforward portion of Scripture, Psalm chapter 1. The message in it is not difficult to discern it says what it says and it says it pretty plainly and some of y'all might say well the King James language kind of throws me a little bit I don't get it quite as plainly as you do well let me help you understand amen there is a way to be blessed there is a way to live for God and to experience all of the best that the Lord has to give there are a lot of Christian people today who are not experiencing the best that God has. They are not experiencing the blessing that God has. And they wonder why. Well, the reason is very simple. You're not walking in the way of blessing. That's my message title tonight. The way of blessing. They're not walking in the way of blessing. What is the way of blessing? The way of blessing is the way you got to walk to be blessed. Amen. The way you've got to walk for God to be able to give you all of His best. There are some kids, I've talked about it before. You know, there are some kids that live their lives, and I'm speaking kindly of myself when I was young. I'm not talking about kids and pointing at you and you, you little kid, you, you know. But there are some young people who behave and conduct themselves in such a way that mom and dad are able to do a lot for them and give a lot to them and they're able to really uh, give that child a lot of room and give them a lot of responsibility and trust them with a lot of good things like a driver's license and a car and yet you have another kid in the same family and you wouldn't dare trust that little booger with a car. You wouldn't dare trust that person with a driver's license, if I tell them the truth. You wouldn't dare let that kid be out after midnight. But if the child wants the parents to be able to give them all their best, then all they have to do is walk the right way, if I tell them the truth. Amen. All you got to do is walk a certain way and mom and dad will recognize that you're responsible. Mom and dad will recognize that you're capable. Mom and dad will recognize that you can handle it. When I was 16, my mother allowed me to get my driver's license right away. And uh, so I got my driver's license, if I remember correctly, it was on my 16th birthday. Well, I was just chomping at the bit to get it, you know. 
But I knew when I got my driver's license that I was driving a great big heavy metal vehicle that could easily kill somebody if you didn't handle it right. And I drove it with respect. And I drove it understanding that this thing is a wonderful blessing but can also be a terrible curse if you're careless with it. So I was responsible and I was careful and my mother knew that she could trust me even at 16 years old. She knew she could trust me to handle the responsibility of driving a car and she knew that I could be counted on. And when I was 16, you know, I used to do a lot of things for the church. I used to do uh, nursing home ministry and a lot of different outreach programs and things. And there were times I wouldn't get home at night after doing some of these things till 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning or later. And I'd go to school the next day. And my mother said, I don't worry about you. I don't worry about you. I know you. I know I you know I, you've been my kid for 16 years. I know that you're responsible and you're careful and I know how you are. So I don't worry about you. If there's a problem, you're going to call, you know? And if I were running late, no, I would call her and tell her, "Mom, you know, now there are kids nowadays, you ask them, please call me if you're going to be in late or if you're going to be out too late about and boy, they just want to have a fit." Oh, they just want to give you trouble. Oh, no. Bless God. Hey, all you're trying to do is ruin my good time. That's all you're trying to do. You just, I, why don't you stay out of my life? <laughs> Let me do what I'm doing. And yet I did it, Jennifer, without a thought. Why? Because I knew it was just a smart thing to do. Why should Mom be at home worrying about me when there's nothing to worry about? Do you hear what I'm telling you? It's not a big issue. See, I'm out. I'm running late. We decided to go out and eat. We, you know, we decided to do whatever. So I'd call and I'd say, Mom, just so you know, we're out. You know, we decided to go out and eat. Blah, blah. She'd be, all right, no problem. I don't worry about you. See, I didn't fight her over it. I just did it. And there are things that as children of God that we can do that will ensure that God can give us the best of the best of the best. And i got news for you, children. God wants you to have the best of the best of the best. God don't want you struggling through life. God don't want you miserable. The Lord doesn't want you depressed. He doesn't want you constantly broke. He doesn't want you constantly struggling. I promise you that's the truth. He doesn't. He wants us to be able... Now, don't misunderstand me. Pastor Charles is not saying he wants you to be a millionaire and he wants you to have gold rings on every finger and he wants you to drive a Rolls Royce and he wants you to live in a mansion. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't care what these prosperity teachers tell you on television. They're lying to you when they tell you that that's how God wants every child of God and every Christian to live. They're telling you a fib. And I'll tell you one reason that that is a flat-out lie. It's very simple, Kylie. It's not a hard thing to grasp. Some people win the lottery today, and they're broke tomorrow. Brother, they don't know how to handle what they got. They don't know how to handle that money. They don't know how to invest it. They don't know how to do nothing. You can give them all the money in the world, and they'll pilfer through it just as fast as it can pass through their hands. They buy a big house that costs an arm and a leg to maintain. You know, they buy a big house that uh, requires all these huge electric bills. It amazes me. I've got people in my own family who drive me crazy all the time because they look at houses, they want to rent and stuff, and they never stop and think about what it's going to cost to run that house. You know, it's one thing to be able to afford the rent. It's another thing to be able to afford the bills. Joshua and I were out, headed out Saturday to storage to pick our altars up. I won't have a church without altars. I don't care what they're doing in churches today. God's house needs to have a place dedicated and consecrated Amen. to prayer. And that's what the altar represents. When you see an altar in a church, that tells you, before you even hear a single word spoken in that church, these people believe in praying. Hallelujah. That's what these little benches represent to us. It's, that's a place of prayer. 
You know what that's here for? It's kind of hard on our floor right now. I understand that. But this is a place where we can come as a family and we can get around and you can kneel and you can pray and you can do it during the service, after the service, before the service. And this is just a place where you and God can meet. You and God can get together and have a little conversation. And you can stop everything because, you know, we live our lives and we're moving and, you know, running around all the time. And the altar, that's a place where we stop everything. Okay, Lord, I'm on my knees. I'm right here. This is our meeting place. This is where we've set up where you and I get together and talk. That's what an altar is. I had to get them altars. I, had to, I said, we're not going to have a single service. <laughs> not one service. Except we're going to have those altars in that place. That's how I believe. It's kind of old-fashioned by today's standards. Well, so be it. A lot of churches you go into today, they got their platform, you know, and got their stairs and all. And, and people come down to the front of the church to pray, but there's no altars. And that bothers me. I, I can't handle that. I want those altars. We went and visited Riverside Church of God a few weeks back. And I was so happy to see that the altars were still in place. I said, here's a church that's been around for a long time that built on prayer. And hallelujah, the altars are still where they ought to be. They're still declaring, we're a people of prayer. Hallelujah. And that's what the preacher even talked about while we were there. And it was a blessing. But Josh and I went out to the storage to get our altars. For this Sunday. And we saw a Jaguar. And Josh said, yeah, there's a car I can handle. I like that. I can, I can have me one of them. Now you all can see Josh saying that. <laughs> <laughs> you all can see Josh. I'm not saying anything surprises you. You're like, yeah, uh -huh, I can see Josh saying that. And I told him, I said, they are beautiful. I love Jaguars. I think they're one of the prettiest cars. Oh, I think they're pretty. They're very attractive. You know, it's a very Britishy style, an old school British style body, you know, but it's beautiful. I love Jaguars. And if you've ever been inside one of them, oh man, they're neat. <laughs> they're really sharp. But don't have to change the oil. You go broke. Don't have to give it a tune-up. You'll have to finance the house. Don't have to replace the tires. Don't have a little fender bender and have to have some work done, you know. Because, honey, every little thing you do with a Jaguar costs an arm and a leg. And there are people. When I was selling cars years ago, there are people.